we do have and do benefit from this economic relationship with China. Uh, but at the same time, we should be very clear-eyed that um, you know what happens in the Indo-Pacific region, and here I'm thinking across the Taiwan Straits. Uh, friction or a kinetic conflict across the Taiwan Straits would affect uh, affect um, technology supply chains, semiconductor supply chains that employ hundreds of thousands of Canadians. Welcome to another installment of the CDA Institute's Expert Series. For this episode, we welcome back Stephen Nagy, Senior Associate Professor at the International Christian University of Tokyo. We discussed Canada's recently released Indo-Pacific policy. Nagi described its strengths and weaknesses, upcoming challenges and opportunities. Nagi also discussed Canada's relationship with ASEAN, strengthening ties with the region, how the region perceives Canada, and cultivating better trade relations with Japan and South Korea. We also discussed how Canada will manage its relationship with China going forward, as well as areas of potential collaboration. Stephen, wonderful to have you back on the program. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, here's my first question for you. What is your initial impression of the newly revealed Indo-Pacific strategy? Are there areas that could be improved? And is there anything new in the document that has not been articulated yet? First, I really applaud the, the um, Global Affairs team and all the people that put together this strategy. It's comprehensive. Uh, it uh, clearly puts China at front and center of how Canada should be thinking about the Indo-Pacific. Um, and what I think is important is that it puts China back in the Indo-Pacific rather than China being the Indo-Pacific. Second, it talks about core partners to achieve Canada's core interests within the region. Um, China as an adversary, but also an important partner to dealing with climate change, non-traditional security issues. It talks about Japan and Korea as being critical partners to promoting a rules-based order within the region and dealing with ch uh, challenges um, in sea lines of communication as well as with North Korea, but also uh, trade and other areas. It talks about the importance of ASEAN centrality and how Canada needs to work with uh, regional institutions such as the ASEAN Plus Three or uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework to uh, engage within the region. So I think these are real strengths. Um, and if we're going to engage in the Indo-Pacific region, we have to um, clearly identify those partners that can be used as a bridge to develop a sustainable, meaningful, and I think, um, uh, in, uh, uh, active presence within the region. Um, I think another important takeaway was there was a strong uh, connection between domestic politics in the Canadian context and some of the uh, areas of focus. So here I'm thinking about um, First Nations reconciliation, I'm thinking about diversity policies and inclusive development, and lastly I'm thinking about environmental policy. And we see these um, really uh, as important pillars in how Canada is going to engage in the Indo-Pacific. First, we're working with Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia uh, to try and engage in First Nations uh, cooperation and dealing with First Nations reconciliation. Uh, these are themes that resonate with the Canadian, Canadian domestic politics, uh, but they are also important themes in building um, uh, transnational partnerships in the Indo-Pacific. In terms of environment, uh, there's strong language and strong commitments to uh, uh, combating climate change with uh, partners. And in terms of diversity, uh, we see that uh, the Canadian Indo-Pacific uh, strategy champions human rights, uh, gender, and uh, 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 LGBT alpha issues uh, in the region, which I think um, are consistent with um, the Trudeau government's uh, actions at home. Uh, so I, these are a few take-homes that I, I have, and I, I think that um, we can talk about some of the, the challenges in the, in the agreement as well. So as I look at the document and the, uh, uh, I guess, the, the rollout of the Indo-Pacific strategy, I, I think that um, it has uh, been and if it, it, the terms of timing has been somewhat problematic. I think that it would have been useful to uh, release the document prior to the uh, November summit tree to uh, allow um, Prime Minister Trudeau to come to the region with his uh, foreign policy team to talk about what Canada wants to do in the region uh, while they were here. So I think that this is uh, probably um, uh, would have been difficult, but uh, I, I think that this would have given uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and uh, Melanie Jolie and the other foreign policy members uh, really the ability to speak to their counterparts and talk about Canada's sustained interest in the region and why based on, on a solid document. 
Second, I think that uh, it would have been useful to um, identify many think tanks in Canada as the tools to implement Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. So here I'm thinking about um, not only the Asia Pacific Foundation, which is an important organization that does good work, but also um, the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, the Donald Laurie Institute, um, Canadian International Council, as, as well as other think tanks to start and have a diversity of engagement within the region. Why is that important is that we want to uh, not be in an echo chamber about of a particular view about the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we want to have uh, many different thinkers uh, engaging in, in the region. I think this is perhaps a shortcoming. It's not including a variety of think tanks as the tools of imp implementation. Uh, third, and I think that this is really important for us to be thinking about, is what does the region expect of Canada? And what can Canada bring to the region that um, is something that uh, really the region wants? And here, I think the security side is great. Uh, the trade side is great. Um, I do think climate change and identifying non-traditional security issues is really good. I do think that we will be challenged in terms of the promotion of some of the more progressive sides of the Indo-Pacific strategy within the region. Um, not because they are bad for the Canadian context, but I don't think um, countries in this part of the world really look at these as priorities for their foreign policy and thinking about the evolution of the Indo-Pacific. We recently spoke with Jonathan Berkshire Miller, who said that we need to make sure we consult ASEAN nations more and not simply prescribe them what we want to contribute. What do you think about this? Could you describe some challenges we may encounter as we seek to strengthen our ties with ASEAN, along with how we are perceived in the region? Well, I think Jonathan's right in that um, we can't be just show up at the door and say, ASEAN, you should do this, you should do that. We need to actually find ways to um, cooperate with them. Now, if we look at ASEAN, uh, ASEAN's priorities, their, their priorities include um, infrastructure and connectivity. They include uh, trying to find a code of conduct in the South China Sea. They include um, you know, prioritizing ASEAN centrality in terms of economic integration and as well as how the region is moving forward. So the question for Canada uh, talking to ASEAN members is how can we um, work with them and support some of these initiatives. Now we do already with uh, 1.5 track dialogue. So um, Canada last year, for example, uh, worked with um, the UK and France and other countries to hold, I think it's the 13th South China Seas Conference. And this was meant to create some opportunities for dialogue about how to move forward on the South China Sea issue. More of this would be helpful. I think Canada could provide uh, legal training to help uh, ASEAN countries better negotiate some of the um, challenges of negotiating uh, a, a code of conduct, but also to have a better understanding of international law and how they can use it as the Filipinos did back in 2016 to us uh, to um, fight at the international court level to secure their uh, interests in the South China Sea. So I think these are great um, initiatives that Canada can in engage in. Um, I do think Canada has a place for health infrastructure in, in, in ASEAN and helping them build the health infrastructure that can deal with not only the current pandemic, but the next pandemic and the next pandemic. Uh, I do also think that Canada has a, a strong role in um, helping mitigate climate change and deal with some of the real uh, challenges in terms of um, a more difficult environment within Southeast Asia uh, as global temperatures increase. So there's a lot on the table there and it, Canada needs to talk to ASEAN countries and talk to ASEAN and see where they align and where Canada can add value to uh, some of ASEAN's uh, interests. And I think those are some areas that uh, we could focus on. You've mentioned that we have an abundance of energy resources and critical minerals for countries like Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. However, you also said that Ottawa needs to consider the impact climate change has had on the Indo-Pacific. With that said, how can Canada balance helping meeting the region's demand for natural resources while helping it transition to renewable energy? So, uh, yeah, we did talk last time about Canada being uh, a reliable and stable supplier of energy and crit critical min minerals to uh, the region's economies and why I mentioned that is that we have those resources, we are reliable and we have many uh, like-minded friends within the region and importantly we could benefit economically. Uh, so I think that this could have been put more front and center in terms of how Canada's Indo-Pacific uh, strategy um, would be uh, 
uh, important for the region and it would be welcomed by the region. Now, can we encourage them to uh, have more, um, I guess, environmentally sustainable forms of energy consumption? Well, yes, and I think that when we look at some of the uh, initiatives that Canada is offering to the region, um, that there is certainly space to do that. Um, and I, I just wrote something for um, the Japan Times, actually, that came out yesterday that talked uh, specifically about that, um, where Canada is talking about um, using its renewable energy uh, resources in the region uh, to export some of its technologies uh, and using those technologies, uh, you know, the hope is that um, if they could reshape the region's economy and, of course, uh, ensure that Can Canadian businesses benefit from being engaged in the region. Um, uh, moving forward, I think that um, Canada should also uh, use frameworks like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework once it joins to start to set standards within the region that um, uh, help uh, the members of the Indo-Pacific Framework to have a smaller environmental footprint, which again is aligned with Canadian domestic priorities about uh, you know, climate change and improving the environment, but also contributing to uh, combating global climate change. I think that the Japanese government is uh, relieved that uh, Canada has released an Indo-Pacific strategy. I think that they see um, that Canada has prioritized and understood clearly that uh, China is a global disruptor and that um, Ch Canada needs to work with like-minded countries to ensure that a rules-based order continues to be the basis for how we engage in international affairs in, in the region. I think that uh, the focus on resilience, the focus on security, focus on trade, uh, the sustained presence through an ex you know uh, uh, through having an office in Singapore, um, these are all very positive elements um, for Japan when looking at Canada's Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Um, I, I also think that um, the way Canada has um, not only focused on uh, in Northeast Asia, but included Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands in, I think, really interesting formulas, and as well as Taiwan, uh, resonate with Japan's uh, long-standing approach to the region, which is through economic engagement, uh, developmental policy, uh, and building strong relationships that support uh, a rules-based order. So I think there's a lot to like on, on, in Japan and amongst uh, many countries within the region. But ultimately now we need to see how the resources are going to be spent and will they be a, have a sustained and meaningful approach. And I think also we have to uh, see if this um, strategy uh, survives beyond uh, uh, Trudeau, uh, Trudeau government, but is continued with whatever the next government is. And I think these are important um, things that Japan is looking for, but also other countries in the region. Do you think the way the strategy as articulated falls in line with the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific? Yes, and I think um, I, I was relieved. Uh, I think that um, in some sectors or some quarters of, of Canadian academia and the think tank world, they have um, basically said that the idea of a free and open and like-minded countries, a free and open Indo-Pacific and like-minded countries isn't something that Canada should be advocating for. Um, I disagree with this. Um, Canadians' post-World War II prosperity, its peace and stability, um, its democratic system, its economic engagement um, in the region has all been based on a, a rules-based order that was uh, founded and supported by like-minded countries. Uh, it's at risk uh, as uh, China and Russia continue to deepen their alignment. Um, they have said explicitly that they would like to weaken international institutions they would like, they talk about redefining what democracy is. They talk about um, redefining what human rights is. Um, they are very much interested in uh, diluting ideas about uh, rule of law and civil society. In the Chinese context, actually, uh, Xi Jinping said himself in, an, in a document called um, Document 9 that was released back in 2014, I believe, um, that these were... Uh, 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 things that uh, the Chinese government should fiercely resist uh, in uh, the domestic context of China. So in a sense, the document that the Canadians released um, has explicitly said that Canada will defend its democratic traditions, human rights, rule of law, 
And I think that this is uh, really, really critical. And we need to always put that front and center of how we think about the Indo-Pacific. Um, at the same time, uh, I was relieved that the document also said that we need to find bridges or crosswalks to work with China on climate change, on transnational security, or trans, uh, non-traditional security challenges, um, uh, such as um, the next pandemic. So uh, I think there's a lot to like. Uh, and again, I was pleasantly surprised that um, this was uh, front and center of the document. Do you think the strategy addresses China's rapid and dramatic modernization of the PLA, along with Beijing's increasingly assertive behavior in the Indo-Pacific? So Canada can't do this alone. And this is why I think the document highlighted the importance of partnerships uh, with Japan, with, with South Korea, with the United States. Uh, it talked a lot about Taiwan and how to that the status quo across the Taiwan Strait is critical for um, for, for stability in the region, but it really focused on partnerships. And I think a country like Canada needs to build active partnerships to uh, have a sustainable diplomatic footprint within the region. I would say that um, per perhaps one area that I, I would think that needs a little bit more focus is really rethinking what it means to be a middle power in the 21st century. And does this mean a, a normative approach to how we engage in uh, issues within the Indo-Pacific? Or does it mean a more pragmatic, realist approach where we have different formulas of cooperation, where we work with middle powers to influence and shape the behavior of, of course, our long-term and closest friend, the United States, uh, but also to uh, work together with middle powers uh, to uh, protect against economic coercion, uh, cyber intrusions, and um, you know the weakening of international institutions. So this is an area as well that I think is something that we should have included in, in the document, uh, a rethink about what our middle power identity and, and diplomacy should look like. Minister Anita Anand recently said that we need to challenge China when we ought to and cooperate when we must. Could you explain what areas are important to challenge China on and what the most important areas of cooperation may be? I think Mr. Anad is correct. Um, and we need to put in the context, China is our second largest trading partner. Uh, and this is not likely to change unless we have a lot more economic cooperation with South Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, India, and others. And I think that the strategy does outline a diversification uh, strat uh, path to uh, selectively diversify away from China. But at the same time, we should be very clear that um, we benefit from trade with China. In fact, um, during the COVID pandemic, our trade increased with China. This is despite record unfavorable ratings, despite the uh, diplomatic, or so the uh, hostage diplomacy uh, arresting both Michael Spavro and Michael Kovrig, uh, and despite you know increasingly assertive behavior. So we do have a do benefit from this economic relationship with China. Uh, but at the same time, we should be very clear eyed that, um, you know, what happens in the Indo-Pacific region. And here I'm thinking across the Taiwan Straits, uh, friction or kinetic conflict across the Taiwan Straits would affect, uh, affect um, technology supply chains, semiconductor supply chains that employ hundreds of thousands of Canadians. You know, those Honda factories and those Toyota factories and other Japanese companies that are based in Ontario, uh, well, they use semiconductors that are produced in this region. So uh, there's a direct link. And the Taiwan Straits is a critical area that I think uh, Minister Anand is thinking about. Uh, we also have the South China Sea with islands that have been, artificial islands that have been built and militarized, which is uh, creating challenges in terms of uh, of stable sea lines of communications in the South China Sea. We saw this summer uh, military drills in and around Taiwan. So definitely China is part of the challenge. But don't forget there's North Korea with weapons of mass, mass production um, uh, expansion. And this has the potential to reshape the uh, region's security environment. And here Canada has an important role in, uh, in enforcing sanctions on North Korea to ensure that it can't or its economy continues to not benefit from uh, evading sanctions. Um, we also have concerns in the Himalayan plateau with uh, between the Chinese and the Indians. Um, so there's a lot on the table and um, we need to be uh, 
clear-eyed about those challenges, but we should also be clear-eyed about, um, I think, China's gray zone tactics within the region, its lawfare operations to, uh, you know, to uh, erode away sovereignty claims of, of islands and territories by the Japanese and other parts of the region. Uh, and we should also be aware of the active use of cyberspace and political influence operations uh, in the region and at home and how um, this can uh, erode away and weaken our democratic system uh, in a way that is not in the interests of Canada.